Miscanthus X gigantus, Miscanthus gigantus, giant Miscanthus, is a sterile hybrid of Miscanthus sinensis and Miscanthus sacriflorus. It is a perennial grass with bamboo-like stems that can grow to heights of more than 4 meters (13 feet) in one season, from the third season onwards. Just like Penicetum purpureum and Saccharum ravenae, it is also called elephant grass. M. X. Gigantus perennial nature, its ability to grow on marginal land, its water efficiency, non-invasiveness, low fertilizer needs, significant carbon sequestration and high yield have sparked a lot of interest among researchers, with some arguing that it has ideal energy crop properties. Some argue that it has the potential to be a greenhouse gas GHG negative fuel, while others highlight its water cleaning and soil enhancing qualities. There are practical and economic challenges related to its use in the existing, fossil-based combustion infrastructure, however. Torrefaction and other fuel upgrading techniques are being explored as countermeasures to this problem. Topic. Use areas M. X. Gigantus is mainly used as raw material for solid biofuels. It can be burned directly, or processed further into pellets or briquettes. It can also be used as raw material for liquid biofuels or biogas. Alternatively, it is possible to use miscanthus as a building material, and as insulation. Materials produced from miscanthus include fiberboards, composite miscanthus, wood particle boards, and blocks. It can be used as raw material for pulp and fibers as well as molded products such as eco-friendly disposable plates, cups, cartons, etc. Miscanthus has a pulp yield of 70-80% compared to dry weight, due to the high holocellulose content. The pulp can be processed further into methyl cellulose and used as a food additive and in many industrial applications. Miscanthus fiber provides raw material for reinforcement of biocomposite or synthetic materials. In agriculture, miscanthus straw is used in soil mulching to retain soil moisture, inhibit weed growth, and prevent erosion. Further, miscanthus high carbon to nitrogen ratio makes it inhospitable to many microbes, creating a clean bedding for poultry, cattle, pigs, horses, and companion animals. Miscanthus used as horse bedding can be combined with making organic fertilizer. Miscanthus can be used as a healthy fiber source in pet food. Topic: Life cycle. Topic: Propagation. Miscanthus X gigantus is propagated by cutting the rhizomes its below ground stems into small pieces, and then replanting those pieces 10 cm below ground. One hectare 2 .5 acres of miscanthus rhizomes, cut into pieces, can be used to plant 10 to 30 hectares of new miscanthus fields multiplication factor 10 to 30. Rhizome propagation is a labor-intensive way of planting new crops, but only happens once during a crop's lifetime. New and cheaper propagation techniques is underway, which seem to increase the multiplication factor from 10 to 30 to 1,000 to 2,000. A halving of the cost is predicted. Topic. Management. A limited amount of herbicide should only be applied at the beginning of the first two seasons, after the second year the dense canopy and the mulch formed by dead leaves effectively reduces weed growth. Other pesticides are not needed. Because of miscanthus high nitrogen efficiency, fertilizer is also usually not needed. Mulch film, on the other hand, helps both M. X. gigantis and various seed-based hybrids to grow faster and taller, with a larger number of stems per plant, effectively reducing the establishment phase from three years to two. The reason seems to be that this plastic film keeps the humidity in the topsoil and increases the temperature. Topic. Yield. 
Miscanthus is close to the theoretical maximum efficiency at turning solar radiation into biomass, and its water use efficiency is among the highest of any crop. It has twice the water use efficiency of its fellow C4 plant maize, twice the efficiency as the C3 energy crop willow Salix viminalis, and four times the efficiency as the C3 plant wheat. This combined efficiency makes miscanthus fields energy dense. Since miscanthus has an energy content of 18 GJ per dry ton, the typical UK dry yield winter harvest of 11 to 14 tons per hectare produce 200 to 250 GJ of energy per hectare per year in that particular region. This compares favorably to maize 98 GJ, oil seed rape 25 GJ, and wheat sugar beet 7 to 15 GJ. Underlining the differences between first and second generation bioenergy crops. In the USA, MX Gigantis has been shown to yield two times more than switchgrass. Hastings et al. note that F. Ild trials have shown that for many locations in Europe, MX Gigantis has the largest energy yield of all potential bioenergy crops in terms of net MJ HA-1, and the highest energy use efficiency EUE, in terms of the energy cost of production, due to its relatively high yields and low inputs. The main competitors yield-wise is willow and poplar, grown in short-rotation coppice SRC, or short-rotation forestry SRF, plantations. Especially in the northern parts of Europe, willow and poplar can approach and sometimes exceed miscanthus winter yields in the same location. The miscanthus peak yield is reached at the end of summer but harvest is typically delayed until winter or early spring. Yield is roughly 33% lower at this point because of leaves drop, but the combustion quality is higher. Delayed harvest also allows nitrogen to move back into the rhizome for use by the plant in the following growing season. In Europe the peak autumn dry mass yield has been measured to 10 to 40 tons per hectare per year, 4 to 16 tons per acre per year, depending on location, with a mean peak dry mass yield of 22 tons. Yields are highest in southern Europe, Roncucci et al., quote dry mass yields of 25 to 30 tons generally for that area under rainfed conditions. With irrigation, trials in Portugal yielded 36 tons, Italy 34 to 38 tons, and Greece 38 to 44 tons. Trials in Illinois, USA, yielded 10 to 15 tons per acre, 25 to 37 t per hectare. Like Europe, yields decrease as you move north. Topic. Yield, arable land In Germany, Felton et al. did a 16-year trial on arable land and concluded with a mean winter-spring yield of 15 tons per hectare per year 6.1 tons per acre per year. McCalment et al. estimate a mean UK yield of 10 to 15 tons if harvested in the spring, while Hastings et al. estimate a pessimistic UK mean yield of 10.5 tons. N. Sanganwamana et al. summarizes several trials, and give these numbers. Austria, autumn harvest 17 to 30. Winter harvest 22. Denmark, autumn harvest 17. Winter harvest 10. France, autumn harvest 42-49. Winter harvest 30. Germany, autumn harvest 17-30. Winter harvest 10-20. Portugal, autumn harvest 39. Winter harvest 26-30. The Netherlands, autumn harvest 25. Winter harvest 16-17. Spain, winter harvest 14. UK, winter harvest 11 to 17. Topic. Yield, marginal land. Marginal land is land with issues that limits growth, for instance low water and nutrient storage capacity, high salinity, toxic elements, poor texture, shallow soil depth, poor drainage, low fertility, or steep terrain. Depending on how the term is defined, between 1.1 and 6.7 billion hectares of marginal land exists in the world. 
For comparison, Europe consists of roughly 1 billion hectare 10 million square kilometers, or 3.9 million square miles, and Asia 4.5 billion hectares 45 million square kilometers, or 17 million square miles. Quinn et al. identified Miscanthus ex gigantis as a crop that is moderately or highly tolerant of multiple environmental stressors, specifically, heat, drought, flooding, salinity below 100 m, and cool soil temperatures down to minus 3.4 degrees Celsius, or 25 degrees Fahrenheit. This robustness makes it possible to establish relatively high yielding Miscanthus fields on marginal land. N. Sanganwamana et al. mentions wastelands, coastal areas, damp habitats, grasslands, abandoned milling sites, forest edges, streamsides, foothills, and mountain slopes as viable locations. Likewise, Stavridou et al. concluded that 99% of Europe's saline, marginal lands can be used for MX gigantis plantations, with only an expected maximum yield loss of 11%. Since salinity up to 200 m does not affect roots and rhizomes, carbon sequestration carry on unaffected. Lewandowski et al. found a yield loss of 36% on a marginal site limited by low temperatures Moscow, compared to maximum yield on arable land in Central Europe. The authors also found a yield loss of 21% on a marginal site limited by drought Turkey, compared to maximum yields on arable soil in Central Europe. Using yield prediction software Miscanfor, 30 days of soil dryness is the mean maximum amount of time a Miscanthus crop can endure before wilting, while 60 days is the maximum before its rhizomes are killed and the crop has to be replanted. In addition to adequate rainfall, soil water holding capacity is important for high yields, especially in dry periods. In fact, Roncucci et al. reports approximately two times better yield for Miscanthus planted in silty clay loam compared to sandy loam soil Italy after a relatively normal growing season precipitation wise, and approximately six times better yield after a growing season containing severe drought. The authors note that in soils with poor water holding capacity, irrigation in the establishment season is important because it allows the roots to reach far deeper underground, thereby increasing the plant's ability to collect water. Irrigation can also increase yield if applied during dry growing seasons, defined as 150 to 300 mm rainfall. The authors argue however that in soils with good water holding capacity, irrigation can potentially be avoided if rainfall exceeds 420 mm. Strichevich et al. make a similar point for crops in Serbia. The soil in this area is generally well wetted at the start of the growing season because of snow melt. If the roots go deep 2 to 3 meters and the soil has good water holding capacity, 300 to 400 millimeters rainfall during the season is enough for good yields 20 to 25 tons per hectare per year. The authors note however that if there are no water constraints at all, that is, if the crops are irrigated, you can actually expect twice the yield 42 tons per hectare per year. N. Sanganwamana et al. found that M. X. gigantis grows well in soils contaminated by metals, or by industrial activities in general. For instance, in one trial, it was found that M. X. gigantis absorbed 52% of the lead content and 19% of the arsenic content in the soil after three months. The absorption stabilizes the pollutants so they don't travel into the air as dust, into groundwater, neighboring surface waters, or neighboring areas used for food production. If contaminated miscanthus is used as fuel, the combustion site need to install the appropriate equipment to handle this situation. On the whole though, miscanthus is a suitable crop for combining biomass production and ecological restoration of contaminated and marginal land. Because of miscanthus' ability to be productive on lower grade agricultural land, including heavy metal contaminated and saline soils, Clifton Brown et al. conclude that miscanthus can contribute to the sustainable intensification of agriculture, allowing farmers to diversify and provide biomass for an expanding market without compromising food security. Topic. Carbon sequestration <laughs> 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 
Topic: Soil carbon input output. Plants sequester carbon through photosynthesis by exchanging O2 oxygen for CO2, thus keeping the carbon C to itself. When the plants move carbon to the roots, it does not stay down there forever however, soil carbon is a balance between the decay of the initial soil carbon and the rate of input. Plant-derived soil carbon is a continuum, ranging from living biomass to humus, and it decays in different stages, ranging from months decomposable plant material, DPM, to hundreds of years humus. The rate of decay depends on many factors, for instance plant species, soil, temperature and humidity, but as long as fresh new carbon is inputted, a certain amount of carbon stay in the ground. In fact Poplau et al. did not find any indication of decreasing SOC soil organic carbon accumulation with age of the plantation indicating no SOC saturation within 15 to 20 years. Harris et al. quote 30 to 50 years of SOC change following a land use change between annual and perennial crops before a new SOC equilibrium is reached. The amount of carbon in the ground under miscanthus fields is thus seen to increase during the entire life of the crop, albeit with a slow start because of the initial tilling, plowing, digging, and the relatively low amounts of carbon input in the establishment phase. Tilling induces soil aeration, which accelerates the soil carbon decomposition rate, by stimulating soil microbe populations. Also, tilling makes it easier for the oxygen o atoms in the atmosphere to attach to carbon C atoms in the soil, producing CO2. Felton et al. argue that high proportions of pre- and direct harvest residues e.g. dead leaves, direct humus accumulation, the well-developed and deep-reaching root system, the low decomposition rates of plant residues due to a high C, N ratio, carbon to nitrogen ratio, and the absence of tillage and subsequently less soil aeration are the reasons for the high carbon sequestration rates. Topic. Net annual carbon accumulation A number of studies try to quantify the net amount of below-ground carbon accumulation each year, after decay is accounted for, in various locations and under various circumstances. Dondini et al. found 32 tons more carbon per hectare 13 tons per acre under a 14-year-old miscanthus field than in the control site, suggesting a combined C3 plus C4 accumulation rate of 2.29 tons per hectare per year 1 ton per acre per year, or 38% of total harvested carbon per year. Likewise, Milner et al. suggest a mean carbon accumulation rate for the whole of the UK of 2.28 tonnes per hectare per year also 38% of total harvested carbon per year, given that some unprofitable land 0.4% of total is excluded. Nakajima et al. found an accumulation rate of 1.96 plus or minus 0.82 tons per hectare per year below a university test site in Sapporo, Japan 0.79 per acre, equivalent to 16% of total harvested carbon per year. The test was shorter though, only six years. Hansen et al. found an accumulation rate of 0.97 ton per hectare per year 0.39 tons per acre per year over 16 years under a test site in Hornum, Denmark, equivalent to 28% of total harvested carbon per year. McCalment et al. compared a number of individual European reports, and found accumulation rates ranging from 0.42 to 3.8 tons per hectare per year, with a mean accumulation rate of 1.84 ton 0.74 tons per acre per year, or 25% of total harvested carbon per year. Topic. Transport and combustion challenges. Topic. Overview Biomass in general, including miscanthus, have different properties compared to coal, for instance when it comes to handling and transport, grinding, and combustion. This makes sharing the same logistics, grinding and combustion infrastructure difficult. Often new biomass handling facilities have to be built instead, which increases cost. 
Together with the relatively high cost of feedstock, this often lead to the well-known situation where biomass projects has to receive subsidies to be economically viable. A number of fuel upgrading technologies are currently being explored however that makes biomass more compatible with the existing infrastructure. The most mature of these is torrefaction, basically an advanced roasting technique which, when combined with pelleting or briquetting, significantly influences handling and transport properties, grindability and combustion efficiency. Topic. Energy density and transport costs Miscanthus chips have a bulk density of only 50 to 130 kg per cubic meter, bales 120 to 160 kg per cubic meter, while pellets and briquettes have a bulk density of 500 and 600 kg per cubic meter respectively. Torrefaction works hand-in-hand -hand with this trend towards a denser and therefore cheaper to transport product, specifically by increasing the product's energy density. Torrefaction removes by gasification the parts of the biomass that has the lowest energy content, while the parts with the highest energy content remain. That is, approximately 30% of the biomass is converted to gas during the torrefaction process and potentially used to power the process, while 70% remains, in the form of pellets or briquettes. This solid product contains approximately 85% of the original biomass energy however. Basically the mass part has shrunk more than the energy part, and the consequence is that the calorific value of torrefied biomass increases to the range of commonly used coal. The higher energy density means lower transport costs, and a decrease in transport-related GHG emittance. The IEA International Energy Agency has calculated energy and GHG costs for regular and torrefied pellets, briquettes. When making pellets and shipping them from Indonesia to Japan, a minimum 6.7% of energy savings or 14% GHG savings is expected when switching from regular to torrefied. This number increases to 10.3% energy savings and 33% GHG savings when making and shipping minimum 50 mm briquettes instead of pellets. Briquette production requires less energy. The longer the route, the bigger the savings. The relatively short supply route from Russia to the UK equals energy savings of 1.8%, while the longer supply route from southeast USA to the Amsterdam-Rotterdam-Antwerp era area is 7.1%. From southwest Canada to era 10.6%, southwest USA to Japan 11%, and Brazil to Japan 11.7%. All these savings are for pellets only. Topic. Water absorption and transport costs Torrefaction also converts the biomass from a hydrophilic water -absorbing to a hydrophobic water -repelling state. Water repelling briquettes can be transported and stored outside, which simplifies the logistics operation and decreases cost. All biological activity is stopped, reducing the risk of fire and stopping biological decomposition like rotting. Topic. Uniformity and customization Generally, torrefaction is seen as a gateway for converting a range of very diverse feedstocks into a uniform and therefore easier to deal with fuel. The fuel's parameters can be changed to meet customers' demands, for instance type of feedstock, torrefaction degree, geometrical form, durability, water resistance, and ash composition. The possibility to use different types of feedstock improves the fuel's availability and supply reliability. Topic. Grindability. Unprocessed MX Gigantis has strong fibers, making grinding into equally sized, very small particles below 75 micrometers millimeters, difficult to achieve. Coal chunks are typically ground to that size because such small, even particles combust stabler and more efficient. 
while coal has a score on the Hardgrove Grindability Index (HGI) of 30 to 100, higher numbers means it is easier to grind. Unprocessed miscanthus has a score of 0. During torrefaction however, the hemicellulose fraction which is responsible for the fibrous nature of biomass is degraded, thereby improving its grindability. Bridgman et al. measured a HGI of 79 for torrefied miscanthus, while the IEA estimates a HGI of 23-53 for torrefied biomass in general. UK coal scores between 40 and 60 on the HGI scale. The IEA estimates an 80-90% to drop in energy use required to grind biomass that has been torrefied. The relatively easy grinding of torrefied miscanthus makes a cost-effective conversion to fine particles possible, which subsequently makes efficient combustion with a stable flame possible. Engibe et al. found that the level of unburnt carbon decreased with the introduction of torrefied biomass, and that the torrefied biomass flames were stable during 50% cofiring and for the 100% case as a result of sufficient fuel particle fineness. Topic. Chlorine and corrosion Raw miscanthus biomass has a relatively high chlorine amount, which is problematic in a combustion scenario because, as Ren et al. explains, the likelihood of corrosion depends significantly on the content of chlorine in the fuel. Likewise, Johansson et al. state that the release of Cl-associated chlorine-associated species during combustion is the main cause of the induced active corrosion in the great combustion of biomass. Chlorine in different forms, in particular combined with potassium as potassium chloride, condensates on relatively cooler surfaces inside the boiler and creates a corrosive deposit layer. The corrosion damages the boiler, and in addition the physical deposit layer itself reduce heat transfer efficiency, most critically inside the heat exchange mechanism. Chlorine and potassium also lowers the ash melting point considerably compared to coal. Melted ash, known as slag or clinker, sticks to the bottom of the boiler, and increase maintenance costs, in order to reduce chlorine and moisture content. MX gigantis is usually harvested dry, in early spring, but this late harvest practice is still not enough of a countermeasure to achieve corrosion-free combustion, however, the chlorine amount in miscanthus reduces by approximately 95% when it is torrefied at 350 degrees Celsius. Chlorine release during the torrefaction process itself is more manageable than chlorine release during combustion, because, the prevailing temperatures during the former process are below the melting and vaporization temperatures of the alkali salts of chlorine, thus minimizing their risks of slagging, fouling and corrosion in furnaces. For potassium, Cambo et al. found a 30% reduction for torrefied miscanthus. However, potassium is dependent on chlorine to form potassium chloride. With a low level of chlorine, the potassium chloride deposits reduce proportionally. Topic. Conclusion Lee et al. conclude that the process of torrefaction transforms the chemical and physical properties of raw biomass into those similar to coal, which enables utilization with high substitution ratios of biomass in existing coal-fired boilers without any major modifications. Likewise, Bridgman et al. state that since torrefaction removes moisture, creates a grindable, hydrophobic and solid product with an increased energy density, torrefied fuel no longer requires, separate handling facilities when co-fired with coal in existing power stations. Smith et al. makes a similar point in regard to hydrothermal carbonization, sometimes called wet torrefaction. Ribeiro et al. note that torrefaction is a more complex process than initially anticipated and state that torrefaction of biomass is still an experimental technology. Michael Wilde, president of the International Biomass Torrefaction Council, stated in 2015 that the torrefaction sector is, in its optimization phase, i.e., it is maturing. He mentions process integration, energy and mass efficiency, mechanical compression and product quality as the variables most important to master at this point in the sector's development. Topic. 
Environmental impacts GHG savings Yield and soil carbon content the amount of carbon sequestrated and the amount of GHG greenhouse gases emitted will determine if the total GHG life cycle cost of a bioenergy project is positive, neutral or negative. Specifically, a GHG, carbon negative life cycle is possible if the total below ground carbon accumulation more than compensates for the above ground total life cycle GHG emissions. Whitaker et al. estimate that for Miscanthus x gigantis carbon neutrality and even negativity is within reach. The authors argue that a Miscanthus crop with a yield of 10 tons per hectare per year sequesters so much carbon that the crop more than compensates for both farm operations emissions and transport emissions. The graphic on the right displays two CO2 negative Miscanthus production pathways, represented in gram CO2 equivalents per megajoule. The green bars represent soil carbon change, the yellow diamonds represent mean values. Emmerling et al. make the same point for Miscanthus in Germany, yield 15 t per hectare per year, carbon sequestration 1.1 t per hectare per year. Miscanthus is one of the very few crops worldwide that reaches true CO2 neutrality and may function as a CO2 sink. Related to the combustion of fuel oil, the direct and indirect greenhouse gas emissions can be reduced by a minimum of 96% through the combustion of miscanthus straw emissions, 0.08 kg CO2 EQMJ-1 fuel oil versus 0.0032 kg CO2 EQMJ-1 miscanthus straw. Due to the sea sequestration during miscanthus growth, this results in a CO2 EQ mitigation potential of 117%. One should note that successful sequestration is dependent on planting sites, as the best soils for sequestration are those that are currently low in carbon. The varied results displayed in the graph highlights this fact. Milner et al. argue that for the UK, successful sequestration is expected for arable land over most of England and Wales, with unsuccessful sequestration expected in parts of Scotland, due to already carbon-rich soils existing woodland. Also, for Scotland, the relatively lower yields in this colder climate makes CO2 negativity harder to achieve. Soils already rich in carbon include peatland and mature forest. Milner et al. further argue that the most successful carbon sequestration in the UK takes place below improved grassland. However, Harris et al. notes that since the carbon content of grasslands vary considerably, so does the success rate of land use changes from grasslands to perennial. The bottom graphic displays the estimated yield necessary to achieve CO2 negativity for different levels of existing soil carbon saturation. The perennial rather than annual nature of miscanthus crops implies that the significant below ground carbon accumulation each year is allowed to continue undisturbed. No annual plowing or digging means no increased carbon oxidation and no stimulation of the microbe populations in the soil, and therefore no accelerated carbon to CO2 conversion happening in the soil every spring. Topic. Savings comparison Fundamentally, the below-ground carbon accumulation works as a GHG mitigation tool because it removes CO2 from the above-ground CO2 circulation the circulation from plant to atmosphere and back into plant, the above-ground circulation is driven by photosynthesis and combustion, first, the miscanthus fields absorb CO2 and assimilates it as carbon in its tissue both above and below ground. When the above-ground carbon is harvested and burned, it is released back into the atmosphere, in the form of CO2. However, an equivalent amount of CO2 and possibly more, if the biomass is expanding is absorbed back by next season's growth, and the cycle repeats. 
This above-ground cycle has the potential to be carbon neutral, but of course the human involvement in the process means additional energy input, often coming from fossil sources. If the fossil energy spent on the operation is high compared to the operation's energy output, the CO2 footprint can approach, match or even exceed the CO2 footprint from burning fossil fuels directly, as has been shown to be the case for several first-generation biofuel projects. Transport fuels might be worse than solid fuels in this regard, the problem can be dealt with both from the perspective of increasing the amount of carbon that is moved below ground see carbon sequestration, above, and from the perspective of decreasing fossil fuel input to the above ground operation. If enough carbon is moved below ground, it can compensate for a bioenergy project's total CO2 emittance. On the other hand, if the above-ground CO2 cost decreases, less below-ground carbon allocation is needed for the bioenergy project to become CO2 neutral or negative. For first-generation bioenergy crops, the greenhouse gas footprints were often large, but second-generation bioenergy crops like Miscanthus reduces its CO2 footprint drastically. Hastings et al. found that Miscanthus crops, almost always has a smaller environmental footprint than first-generation annual bioenergy ones. A large meta-study of 138 individual studies, done by Harris et al., revealed that second-generation perennial grasses Miscanthus and switchgrass planted on arable land on average store five times more carbon in the ground than short-rotation coppice or forestry plantations poplar and willow. Compared to fossil fuels, the GHG savings are large. Without adding in the carbon sequestration negative numbers, Miscanthus fuel has a GHG cost of 0.4 to 1.6 grams CO2 equivalents per megajoule, compared to 33 grams for coal, 22 for liquefied natural gas, 16 for North Sea gas, and 4 for wood chips imported to Britain from the USA. Confirming the above numbers, McCalment et al. found that the mean energy input out output ratios for miscanthus is 10 times better than for annual crops, while GHG costs are 20 to 30 times better than for fossil fuels. For instance, miscanthus chips for heating saved 22.3 tons of CO2 emittance per hectare per year in the UK 9 tons per acre, while maize for heating and power saved 6.3 2.5 per acre. Rapeseed for biodiesel saved only 3.2 1.3 per acre. Lewandowski et al. found that each hectare 2.47 acres of Central European arable land planted with miscanthus can reduce the atmospheric CO2 level with up to 30.6 tons per year, save 429 gigajoules of fossil energy used each year, with 78 euros earned per ton reduced CO2 2,387 euros earned per hectare per year given that the biomass is produced and used locally within 500 kilometers 310 miles for miscanthus planted on marginal land limited by cold temperatures moscow the reduction in atmospheric co2 is estimated to be 19.2 tons per hectare per year 7 7 tons per acre with fossil energy savings of 273 gigajoules per hectare per year 110 gigajoules per acre for marginal land limited by drought Turkey, the atmospheric CO2 level can potentially be reduced with 24 tons per hectare per year 9.7 tons per acre, with fossil energy savings of 338 gigajoules per hectare per year 137 tons per acre. Based on similar numbers, Poplow and Don expect miscanthus plantations to grow large in Europe in the coming decades. Whitaker et al. state that after some discussion, there is now 2018 consensus in the scientific community that the GHG balance of perennial bioenergy crop cultivation will often be favorable, also when considering the implicit direct and indirect land use changes. Topic. Biodiversity 
Below ground, Felton and Emmerling found that the number of earthworm species per square meter was 5.1 for Miscanthus, 3 for Maize, and 6, 4 for Fallow, totally unattended land, and state that, it was clearly found that land use intensity was the dominant regressor for earthworm abundance and total number of species, because the extensive leaf litter on the ground helps the soil to stay moist, and also protect from predators. They conclude that, Miscanthus had quite positive effects on earthworm communities, and recommend that, Miscanthus may facilitate a diverse earthworm community even in intensive agricultural landscapes. N. Sanganwamana et al. found that the bacterial activity of certain bacteria belonging to the proteobacteria group almost doubles in the presence of M. x. gigantis root exudates. Above ground, Lewandowski et al. found that young Miscanthus stands sustain high plant species diversity, but as the Miscanthus stands mature, the canopy closes, and less less sunlight reach the competing weeds. In this situation it gets harder for the weeds to survive. After canopy closure, Lewandowski et al. found 16 different weed species per 25 square meters plot. The dense canopy works as protection for other life forms though, Lewandowski et al. notes that, Miscanthus stands are usually reported to support farm biodiversity, providing habitat for birds, insects, and small mammals. Supporting this view, Caslin et al. argue that the flora below the canopy provides food for butterflies, other insects and their predators, and 40 species of birds, both Houghton et al. and Bellamy et al. found that the Miscanthus overwinter vegetative structure provided an important cover and habitat resource, with high levels of diversity in comparison with annual crops. This effect was particularly evident for beetles, flies, and birds, with breeding skylarks and lapwings being recorded in the crop itself. The Miscanthus crop offers a different ecological niche for each season. The authors attribute this to the continually evolving structural heterogeneity of a Miscanthus crop, with different species finding shelter at different times during its development. Woodland birds found shelter in the winter and farmland birds in the summer. For birds, 0.92 breeding pairs species per hectare 0.37 per acre was found in the Miscanthus field, compared to 0.28 0.11 in the wheat field. The authors note that due to the high carbon to nitrogen ratio it is in the field's margins and interspersed woodlands that the majority of the food resources are to be found. Miscanthus fields work as barriers against chemical leaching into these key habitats however, Caslin et al. further argue that Miscanthus crops provides better biodiversity than cereal crops, with three times as many spiders and earthworms as cereal. Brown hare, stoat, mice, vole, shrew, fox and rabbit are some of the species that are observed in Miscanthus crops. The crop act as both a nesting habitat and a wildlife corridor connecting different habitats. Water quality McCalment et al. claim that Miscanthus fields leads to significantly improved water quality because of significantly less nitrate leaching. Likewise, Whitaker et al. claim that there is drastically reduced nitrate leaching from Miscanthus fields compared to the typical maize soy rotation because of low or zero fertilizer requirements, the continuous presence of a plant root sink for nitrogen, and the efficient internal recycling of nutrients by perennial grass species. For instance, a recent meta study concluded that Miscanthus had nine times less subsurface loss of nitrate compared to maize or maize grown in rotation with soya bean. Topic: <inaudible> Soil quality. The fibrous, extensive Miscanthus rooting system and the lack of tillage disturbance improves infiltration, hydraulic conductivity and water storage compared to annual row crops, and results in the porous and low bulk density soil typical under perennial grasses, with water holding capabilities expected to increase by 100-150 mm. N. Sanganwamana et al. argue that Miscanthus improves carbon input to the soil, and promote microorganism activity and diversity, which are important for soil particle aggregation and rehabilitation processes. 
On a former fly ash deposit site, with alkaline pH, nutrient deficiency, and little water holding capacity, a miscanthus crop was successfully established, in the sense that the roots and rhizomes grew quite well, supporting and enhancing nitrification processes, although the above-ground dry weight yield was low because of the conditions. The authors argue that MX Gigantis' ability to improve soil quality even on contaminated land is a useful feature especially in a situation where organic amendments can be added. For instance, there is a great potential to increase yield on contaminated marginal land low in nutrients by fertilizing it with nutrient-rich sewage sludge or wastewater. The authors claim that this practice offer the three-fold advantage of improving soil productivity, increasing biomass yields, and reducing costs for treatment and disposal of sewage sludge in line with the specific legislation in each country. Topic. Invasiveness Miscanthus x gigantis parents on both sides, M. sinensis and M. sacrifloris, are both potentially invasive species, because they both produce viable seeds. M. x gigantis does not produce viable seeds however, and N. sanguinwamana et al. claim that there has been no report on the threat of invasion due to rhizome growth extension from long-term commercial plantations to neighboring arable land. Topic. Conclusion There seem to be agreement in the scientific community that a shift from annual to perennial crops have environmental benefits. For instance, Lewandowski et al. conclude that analyses, of the environmental impacts of miscanthus cultivation on a range of factors, including greenhouse gas mitigation, show that the benefits outweigh the costs in most cases. McCalment et al. argue that although there is room for more research, clear indications of environmental sustainability do emerge. In addition to the GHG mitigation potential, miscanthus, perennial nature and below-ground biomass improves soil structure, increases water holding capacity up by 100 to 150 mm, and reduces runoff and erosion. Overwinter ripening increases landscape structural resources for wildlife. Reduced management intensity promotes earthworm diversity and abundance although poor litter palatability may reduce individual biomass. Chemical leaching into field boundaries is lower than comparable agriculture, improving soil and water habitat quality. Milner et al. argue that a change from first-generation to second-generation energy crops like miscanthus is environmentally beneficial because of improved farm-scale biodiversity, predation and a net positive GHG mitigation effect. The benefits are primarily a consequence of low inputs and the longer management cycles associated with second-generation crops. The authors identifies 293,247 hectares of arable land and grassland in the UK equivalent to 1.3% of the total land area where both the economical and environmental consequences of planting miscanthus is seen as positive. Whitaker et al. argue that if land use tensions are mitigated, reasonable yields obtained, and low carbon soils targeted, there are many cases where low input perennial crops like miscanthus, can provide significant GHG savings compared to fossil fuel alternatives. In contrast to annual crops, miscanthus have low nitrogen input requirements, low GHG emissions, sequesters soil carbon due to reduced tillage, and can be economically viable on marginal land. The authors agree that in recent years, a more nuanced understanding of the environmental benefits and risks of bioenergy has emerged, and it has become clear that perennial bioenergy crops have far greater potential to deliver significant GHG savings than the conventional crops currently being grown for biofuel production around the world e.g. corn, palm oil and oilseed rape. The authors conclude that the direct impacts of dedicated perennial bioenergy crops on soil carbon and N2O are increasingly well understood, and are often consistent with significant life cycle GHG mitigation from bioenergy relative to conventional energy sources. Topic. Practical farming considerations 
For practical farming advice, see Iowa State University's Giant Miscanthus Establishment PDF. See also the Best Practice Manual jointly developed by TGISC, the Agriculture and Food Development Authority in Ireland, and AFBI, the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute, also Ireland.